Part 9 of This is the End by Stella Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Anonyma, on her return to the inn, was very generous with word vignettes dealing with nature. Her family during supper was not left in ignorance as to the peace and meaning of the sea and the parallel between waves and generations, and the miracles of the mist, and the tranquil musing of the beaches, and the unseen imminence of the downs. It would make a wonderful background to a short story, said Anonyma, and then she stopped rather abruptly. Her silence after that might have struck the family as strange, had it not coincided with the arrival of the evening paper, which turned the listener's thoughts to less beautiful matters. Air-raid, said Cousin Gustus, I prophesied quite a long time ago that we should have another raid, but nobody ever listens to what I say. Two horses killed somewhere in the eastern counties. I thought somewhere was a town in France. Ha <laughs> ha! said Mrs. Russell. "'Was London attacked?' asked Mr. Russell. "'I'm rather anxious about St. Paul's.' Anonyma rose to the surface again. "'I had such a wonderful talk with a bus conductor once about his experiences during a raid. Such an intelligent man. I dearly love bus conductors. Such an interesting and vivacious class.' I should feel it an honor to be intimate with one. He told me in the most vivid terms how a bomb fell in the street in front of his bus, blowing the preceding bus to atoms. He told me how his driver turned the bus in what he called the spice of Arthur Crown and plunged into a side street. He said that he could see the zeppelin balanced on his searchlights like a sausage on stilts, and when it was directly above them, the top of his bus was suddenly cleared of people as if by magic, except for one man who put up an umbrella and sat tight. I pity the conductor. It must have been a terrible experience. His eyes were starting from his head, bulging like a rabbit's. He said he had a wife and baby up laden way, and that he was so worried about them that he frequently called out his list of destinations the wrong way round. "'Look here,' said Mr. Russell. "'I think I'd better go up and see about—' "'Nonsense,' said his wife. "'I refuse to go to London until the moon is there to protect me, as it were. "'So comic to look upon a heavenly body as a practical protection. "'I will not allow you to run needlessly into danger.' Only this morning you were making plans to go to Cornwall, naughty boy. No, but... Darling, I insist, said Mrs. Russell. Cornwall, it is for the present. If you say another word, I shall smack you and put you in the corner. Ha <laughs> ha! Cornwall, it was. The family drew near to its destination on a misty day. The sun shone not at all, but occasionally showed its bare, pale outline through a veil of cloud. The road in front of Christina was so dim that Mr. Russell could people it for himself with imaginations. Now a knight in armor stood at the next corner. Now a phantom sea gleamed over the curve of the road. Now he saw great, slim ghosts beckoning him on. There were real sheep every few hundred yards, for a sheep fair was taking place somewhere nearby. The sheep came out of the mist like armies of giants, and shrank as they grew clearer. The roads were rippled with the footprints of many sheep. Even when there were no sheep in sight, the mist filled their places with ghostly flocks. Each sheep, as it passed, examined the wheels of Christina as long as the dogs allowed it to do so. Each flock was followed by two men, 
and sometimes a child in ill-fitting clothes on a pony, and sometimes a woman with a shawl over her head. Anonyma's notebook became very restless, and finally Mr. Russell was obliged to drive the family to the point whither the sheep were bound. So they went to the little town, through which the excitement of the fair thrilled like the blast from a trumpet. Bewildered sheep looked in at his shop windows. Farmers in dog-carts shouted affectionate remarks to each other across its village green, and introduced dear friends at a great distance to other dear friends with much formality. Dogs argued in a professional way about the merits of their sheep. Mr. Russell's hound, who had never before heard the suggestion that dogs were intended for any purpose but ornament, looked on breathless with surprise. His morals were affected for life by the revolutionary sight of a dog biting the tail of a disobedient sheep. "'I'll try it in Kensington Gardens,' thought Mr. Russell's hound, as he looked nervously at his master. Christina, the motor-car, found her way to the center of this activity. There the sheep bleated in tight confinement, and to each pen was attached the appropriate dog, looking very self-conscious. Dogs who had come from great distances to buy sheep were anxiously sniffing up the smell of their purchases, so that no mistake might be made on the way home. Over the line of pens, a two-plank viaduct ran, and it was bent continually by the weight of large shepherds balancing their way along to take a bird's-eye view of possible bargains. A facetious auctioneer with the village policeman's arm round his neck was sitting on the wall at the end of the field, addressing everybody very frequently as gentlemen. Sheep arrived, and sheep departed constantly. "'Isn't it terribly slavish somehow?' said Anonyma. "'The sheep never being consulted at all, "'bought and sold and smelt and spat upon, "'as if they had no heart beating beneath that wall. "'No me, as Jay used to say.' "'Mr. Russell heard and remembered. "'There were few doubts left in him "'as to the truth of his too funny miracle.' He had a little tune, the scaffolding of a poem, in his head, and to the sound of it he lived that day, although I don't expect he ever got the poem into words. If you start your idea along an uncertain course, you have to stop and start afresh to get it straight. You can never finish it when once it has a crooked swing. I gather that motorcyclists occasionally have much the same experience with their machines. But Mr. Russell, with a mind steering a tangled course, asked for nothing better. He was very nearly sure of romance for the first time in his life. I hope that the feeling of making poetry is not confined to the people who write it down. There is no luxury like it and I hope we all share it. I think, perhaps, the same thrill that goes through Mr. Russell and me, when the ghost of a completed thing begins to be seen, also delights the cocky coster who writes his first, and very likely last, love letter from France. And the little old country mother, who lies awake, composing the in memoriam of her son for a local paper. And the burglar, down Oxton, who takes off his cap as a child's funeral goes by. The feeling is, this is a thing out of my heart that I am showing. This is my best confession, and nobody knew there was this within me. I am sure that that great glory of poetry in one's heart does not wait on achievement. If it did, what centuries would die unglorified? It is just perfection appearing to your equal pride and shame, a perfection that never taunts you with your limitations. Mr. Russell and Christina knew well their road through the mist that afternoon. 
there was no difficulty in the world, and no need to see or to think. The signposts all spoke the names of faded places. It was useless for Anonyma to study the map. She found no mention there of the enchanted way on which their course was set. "'We will not go through Launston,' said Anonyma. "'There must be a quicker way to the sea than that.' Mr. Russell cared not for her, and cared not for Launston. The spell was cast upon Christina's wheels. There was no escaping the appointed way. Launston reached out its net and caught them. Almost as far as the post office, Anonyma was protesting. We will not go through Launston. Launston was determined to get us, laughed Mrs. Russell. Ha ha! Isn't it humorous the way things happen? The sun was setting as they first saw the Cornish Sea. The sky was swept suddenly clear of mist. The seagulls against the sky were like little crucified angels. The road ran to the shore. The sun had little delicate clouds across its face, like the islands in a Japanese painting. The wet rocks that lay in the sun's path were plated with gold, and the tall waves with shadowed faces made of that path a ladder. The fields of foam on the sea looked very blue in the pale light. The sun was like an angel with a flaming sword. The angel dipped his feet into the sea. The sun was like a flaming stage for the comedies of gods. A ship passed dramatically across it. One's dazzled eyes saw great phantom ships all over the sea. The sun was like a monster with horns of fire that pierced one's two eyes. And gradually it sank. The sun was like a word ridden between the sea and the sky, a word that was swallowed up by the sea before any man had time to read it. There was suddenly no sun. The little forsaken clouds were like flames for a moment, and then they were blown out. Mr. Russell waved his right hand towards great cliffs like the towers of kings behind the village. This is the place, he said. If I have dared to surrender some imitation of splendor, something I knew that was tender, something I loved that was brave, if in my singing I showed songs that I heard on my road, were they not debts that I owed rather than gifts that I gave? If certain hours on their climb up the long ladder of time turned my confusion to rhyme, drove me to dare an attempt, if by fair chance I might seem sometimes abreast of my theme, was I translating a dream? Was it a dream that you dreamt? High and miraculous skies, bless and astonish my eyes. All my dead secrets arise, all my dead stories come true. Here is the gate to the sea. Once you unlocked it for me. Now, since you gave me the key, shall I unlock it for you? End of part nine.